This week on Ask an Entomologist, we have to ask a biological anthropologist, why don't we eat bugs in Western culture? And conducting this interview with me is Dr. Julie Lesnick. I just wanted you to like introduce yourself. Who are you? Um, what do you have your master's and PhD in? Okay. Um, my name is Julie Lesnick. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And I have my PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan. Um, I also have a master's of science in kinesiology. So I studied exercise science and nutrition as well, in addition to anthropology. What exactly like is exercise science? <laughs> That's a good question. So the exercise science is pretty broad. A lot of people do um, like there's like the biomechanic aspect of it. So what your joints are doing and, and you know, efficiencies and things like that. Um, but I really focused on the nutrition and metabolism side of it. So um, what's the nutrition that an endurance runner uses and what substrates, you know, what do they tap into in their system? Where are they getting the carbs? Is it from the free floating glucose in their blood or is it from stores? And so that was the stuff I really focused on was more the physiology. But um, I think it falls, there's a, a wide range of things. I know biomechanics is one. I'm trying to think of what other th people did in my department. It's been a while. <laughs> worked um, out a lot. Yeah, yeah exactly. It worked <laughs> out a lot. Um, it is, yeah, I always felt it was always the, like, people would show up to work and be like, yeah, so I was at the gym this morning. I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get from, like, anthropology and basically nutrition to entomophagy? Yeah, so... Is it entomophagy or entomophagy? I think, so I actually, this is funny because I read it, you know, yeah. more as a, and that's always a problem I think scientists have is that we, re, we're read, so, it, we yeah. read it and then we don't know how to say it. So I actually went on, like, the Webster's Dictionary online and hit the play where she says the word. <laughs> So she said entomophagy, so okay. that's what I've been going with. Yeah, because it comes from Greek, so phagy is just like mouth yeah, or eating. Yeah, so. and it's hard because yeah. like, you know, there's, I would say geophagy, if I was talking about people that eat soil. Yeah. Or something, or, but, I, but entomophagy. Fugy. So it's all just where you put the, it, it depends on your prefix and where the, and, and what the, and yeah, and is on the syllable <laughs> of your prefix, then changes how you sit, pronounce the suffix. It's very odd. So, so the Webster Dictionary lady said excellent. entomophagy. <laughs> excellent. Um, so how did I get there? So yeah, I study, so in anthropology, I study evolution of the human diet. So I got into um, my PhD program really wanting to kind of create the life ways, like what early hominids were doing. Um, and I think it's the same that kind of like in being an entomologist, you might be somebody who's really interested in taxonomy or you might be somebody who's really interested in behavior. And so it, it falls that way with the fossil hominids too. Some people are really interested in determining how these fossil hominid species are related. And I really wanted to figure out what they did. How they lived. Yeah, how they lived. And so a big part of, you know, being a large ape in a savanna environment is how do you find food? What do you eat? And so, um, so I decided that's where my, you know, my, my research interests lied. And so then I got the kind of master's in kinesiology to make me understand human nutrition better because um, the other thing in studying human evolution is you have both the proximate and ultimate. So like the ultimate reason that we eat is so that, you know, we don't, don't die, die out as a species. <laughs> but the proximate reason you eat is the things I really learned in kind of the exercise physiology, so like the, the hormone ghrelin sending the signal to your brain that it's time to eat. So I knew I was a better understanding of all of evolution of why we eat by having kind of both that ultimate proximate. Um, and so that's where I came from. So then like, okay, well, what were these Australopithecines eat, eating? And so the best model for a large-bodied ape living nearly two million years ago is a large-bodied ape today that lives in its natural environment, not in, not in a human society, but that, you know, needs to get food from the forest. And so chimpanzees being small-brained, kind of like these early hominids were pretty small-brained, were the best model. And chimpanzees eat a pretty good amount of termites. And so I started reconstructing the termite portion of the hominid diet, and then all of a sudden started appreciating termite variability. And and got here you again, are. here I am. Got more interested in insects than I ever thought possible. They're pretty interesting. Yeah, they're pretty lie. interesting. So um, so that's how I got into that's how I got into insects. And then it just so happens that you know, as I was, I guess I'd already finished my PhD. I got my PhD in 2011, 
And then it was in May of 2013 that the UN came out with their big statement on why we should really be looking at insects as a sustainable food source. Um, and so now all of a sudden I had all this knowledge that was useful to kind of promoting this food source. So that's how I got involved. I was wondering, you mentioned how you use like modern chimps and apes. So how do you use these or like these modern models to predict like what happened thousands and thousands of years ago. Yeah, and um, I, I kind of I kind of jumped <laughs> over that, but alluded to it a little bit. And a lot of it, you know, in trying to figure out what was going on a million years ago, like we have the fossil record, and so we know like what their brain size was or what their body size was, and so we know that the kind of jump to our body size and our brain size doesn't happen until much later. Um, so it's like with Homo erectus at like 1.8 million years or so is when we start seeing the trends towards what we ultimately look like. These We have these giant brains that are hugely like energetically expensive. So our diet has to support these giant brains. So looking back at the earlier hominids that don't have these giant brains, they have brain size and body size that much more reflects what the chimpanzees do. Um, and so we know that these early hominids are also a lot closer to the last common ancestor with chimps than we are. So um, we share a last common ancestor with chimpanzees probably about five or six million years ago. Um, it's important to note that the last common ancestor is neither human nor no chimp. chimp. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a chimp. Um, but chimpanzees haven't had to change their environment much. So they have not adapted to such specialized niches like we have. So chimpanzees and gorillas and like orangutans, like they're all different, but they're still very ape-like. You know? yeah. And so this last common ancestor would be different, but still very ape-like and so it's kind of that's how I'm able to tie them together. So how do we use modern humans to bridge that jump to like Neanderthals or Homo erectus mm -hmm. the rest of them? Yeah so in trying to figure out you know so I think it's pretty easy to almost reconstruct the early hominid insect portion of their diet because you're like oh what do chimps do? Oh that's probably what they were doing you know and and that's using social insects like you know termites and ants you know it's pretty predictable if you go to a termite mound you're gonna find termites. termites. Um, but then as we get these bigger brains and, and use source utilization needs to be a little bit more refined, starting to think about what you know Homo erectus was doing or, or what Homo sapiens starts doing, it's like, well, the better model for them then is people that live in this same, you know, what I would call subsistence level in their environment where their entire livelihood depends on the output of the environment they're living in. There's no, they're not, taking control, they're not intensifying, they're not cultivating, it's just, I'm hungry, what's the forest have to offer? Um, and so it's those kind of foragers or hunter-gatherers that I use to create these models of how insects may have been used in the diets of these, you know, in, in the genus Homo, once you get Homo erectus especially, once brain size gets big, you know, they're starting to navigate their environments a lot differently where it's not just like, oh, big termite mound, there's termites, like there might be more preference giving to certain insects or they might start looking for, you know, insects that you can collect with a net, start using tools. Um, and so we see foragers use insects in a wide range of ways. And so I think that with later on with the genus Homo, they'd start exploring those different uses as well. I know I'm talking a lot. Too. <laughs> it's awesome. But no, I think this is so interesting. I had like no idea about really any of this. This is, I think this is so awesome. Good. You say that like chimps and early humans probably like always ate insects. Why do you think they were so important into the diet? I, I think we look at, so one thing with, with insects as food is that they are animal foods just like meat is, you mm -hmm. know? And, and, the, and one of the most important things about, about animal products is, is fat content. Like we have this like, <laughs> oh, fat is bad, especially it started in the 80s. Like, all of a sudden, fat was so bad in the 80s, and now low-fat diets. But, like, fat is you good. Need it. Like, yeah. yeah, if you're trying to survive in the environment, that's a pocket of calories that's going to get you through the day. I know you can starve to death on rabbits because there's not enough fat. Not enough fat. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's like, so we have this, like, such a negative connotation of fat, but, like, it's a macronutrient. Like, mm -hmm. it's important. We need fat. Um, and so, so, one is that insects are an animal product that has this animal fat animal fat, which is so such an energy-rich source, 
But two, the protein component of animals tend to be what, what we would consider a complete uh, protein profile. It has all of the essential amino acids are present in animal proteins. So that's why when people go vegan, like yes, you mm -hmm. can get protein from beans or whatnot, but you don't get all of the amino acids. So you need to be really specialized in your vegan diet to make sure you get yeah. a complete amino acid profile. But if you just ate meat, you get all your amino acids. Mm -hmm. yeah. So insects are just as valuable as meat uh, in that way. So fat and protein and complete protein, but at the same time, a lot easier to catch. Like yeah. that idea that a termite mound is going to be there, it's easy to spot, and you can get termites out of it, um, is a lot easier than p being so risky in, in trying to chase down an antelope that you might not catch. Yeah. Um, and so the, and then also, or like a small, even like a rabbit, like you're saying like, oh, one rabbit can only go so far, but that termite mound will always be there and always yeah. be producing. And you don't have to put out as much energy to like run after a rabbit or an antelope. Yes. You just like sit there with a stick. And exactly. Like, um. You just sit there and eat all day. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to basically ask you to summarize your talk today. Okay. So the main question that we got for the blog is like, why does Western culture have mm -hmm. an aversion to eating insects? So if you were to like name three major contributing factors to that, right. what would it be? Okay. So one, we don't see eating insects in the Western diet because there is a bit of a cultural taboo to it. Insects are pests. Insects are thought to transmit diseases. Um, I also think a lot of how we live is um, people try to remove themselves remove themselves from their natural environment as much as possible. So an insect that comes into your house is an invader and, it, and, and they're breaking our boundaries between us and them. I actually had a really interesting talk. I have a friend in Ecuador and he was like, what do you research? And I was actually doing IPM in school. So I was like, well, I'm doing pest management in schools. And he's like, I don't understand. Right. And I thought about it. Like they don't have an inside or an outside. Right. Like everything is just there. Right. But it was like, wow, like here we definitely like set up these barriers. Like yeah. that cockroach enters that threshold. It will die. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, so kind of going into number two, part of the reason is exactly like, so in the tropics, like there's so many, if you travel internationally, especially to some place like closer to the tropics, like windows just are windows and they don't have screens. Yeah. Like insects just kind of come and you, and you kind of learn to live with the insects, not against them so much. So that's more possible though in, in the tropics than up here because one thing that we do, the buildings we build create microhabitats. Yeah. And so where I'm from is Detroit, and right now Detroit's under a foot of snow. I'm from Connecticut, I yeah. understand. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you need the building to keep out the outside mm -hmm. because we can't live in negative 10 degree weather. Like we need to create a microhabitat so our inside temperature is we even have a word for it, room temperature. Everybody knows what room temperature is, but yeah. it's completely socially constructed, the yeah. 70 degrees that we're comfortable in. I never really thought about that, yeah. but it's totally true. Yeah. Like, <laughs> everyone in the world knows what room temperature is. Yes, and so it's so this idea of room temperature is really important to our survival in these northern latitudes, mm -hmm. and so insects become much more of a pest and, in, and invasive in our homes when we need to have a temperature inside that's different than the outside in order to survive. And be energy efficient and to be, do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so to be able to, you know, completely close off the house and seal it. Mm -hmm. And so when you have an open seal, not only are you letting the cold air in, but then an insect's coming in. So they're also a signal that you're not sealed off for the cold or whatever it's gonna be. Um, so that's kind of two, is that, you know, we are more restrictive in our, in our house zones <laughs> up in the north because you have to. Yeah. Um, but three, and this is kind of where my evolution of the human diet comes in, is that the northern latitudes have always been cold and always been snowy. And so there's, there, have not, there has not been a prevalence of insect eating ever in Europe or North America because the first people to populate these areas moved there when they were glaciated. And so there was no way that they were surviving off of eating insects. So eating insects is very much a tropical thing. It's been a tropical thing over the course of human evolution, and it's still a tropical thing today. And so for all of these reasons, we just, we've never done it up here, and then because of how we've managed to live up here, insects became the, the, that horrible outside thing we're trying to keep out. So you're saying that in Africa, like when we were evolving, we ate insects, then basically Homo erectus, from what I understand, was like evolved and was like, time to get out, yep, and then and it left. left. 
Yeah. And then so they went up through Europe. And no, so Homo erectus, when they first left, they stayed in the temperate right. area. Okay. Yeah, so they went to, so almost as soon as we see them in Africa, they're in Indonesia. Okay. So they just like. So then right. it was the Neanderthals. And so, up. yeah, so then there's some branch off of Homo erectus or some branches. Mm-hmm. We know the Neanderthals the best. Um, but we're starting to get evidence that everybody was probably up in Siberia at the same time, too. Um, so somewhere around 200,000 years ago, hundred, yeah, something like that, 150,000 years ago, something like that, I don't even know. Um, you have a branch of, probably off of that Homo erectus population that decided to brave the cold <laughs> and go north. <laughs> and then they came around through the Ice Bridge yeah. to the Americas yes. and then colonized South America and those tropics yeah. from the north. Yes. So then did they just re-pick up yeah. the insect so, eating? Yeah. So it would have had to have been rediscovered because you show up in the tropics, you need food. Hey, there's a termite mound, <laughs> you know, like, and it's, it's that, again, all of the same reasons that it was picked up originally in Africa it, are going to be true, you know, millions of years later when you're colonizing the tropics in South America. Like, oh, man, that's much easier to go to that termite mound than to try to hunt that deer. Yeah. You know, so, it's, so it just becomes dependable again. Yeah, easier. Humans are lazy. (laughs) Well, it is, and it's efficiency. I mean, it's all about energy input and output, and you know, it all. It actually, and a lot of what I do shows how the women forage for the insects more than the men. And you know, it's one thing is hunting's risky. You could get hurt. You know, and so it's something men do more because women's survival is so much important, more important for the yeah. survival of their kid. Yeah. Um, they also can't take their kid hunting with them for the most what, part. You can't. <laughs> I mean, again, they're risking themselves and their kids. So, from an evolutionary point, point of view, the point of, of evolution is to survive and reproduce. Yeah. And so, insects allowed women to survive and reproduce without having to do rely on riskier resources. Um, and, and it just all comes, you know, so things that are easy, the, the easier it is, the more energy you have to reproducing. So the more energy you put to finding your food, the less energy you have for reproducing. Yeah. So when, when you're not putting out tons of energy over there, you can sit and have more babies, you know, and it just, so that's kind of how the, the very easy economy of how evolution works is kind of this input output balance. Yeah. So. Um, so I kind of want to shift gears to like yeah. the future. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so in your talk, you talked about how like climate change affected nutrition. So as you got to like the cold north, basically you couldn't eat insects anymore. But also agriculture had a really big play. So mm-hmm. if you could sit down and grow food, like why would you go look for it? Um, so I was wondering what you thought about climate change now. Like how do you think it's going to have an effect? Do you like how we perceive food and how we perceive insects as food? Mm-hmm. And if so, like what do you think? going to happen. I think, and this is something I did not talk about, and just kind of, you just kind of tip something in my brain that made me think, because, you know, thinking about um, climate change, like, one of the things, and, and thinking about risk in, in agriculture is agriculture is really risky because we are so dependent on corn and yeah, soybeans. And wheat. And wheat. <laughs> and so if something happens where our strains of corn or soybeans or wheat don't survive, through whatever climactic variability that's coming up, that's going to be a huge... I mean, that it's going to be catastrophic. Yeah. Um, and so one thing insects provide is, is variability. And so the best human diet is, you know, monocultures are traditionally bad. Like <laughs> because, <bananas. laughs> Yeah. And so monocultures tend to be bad. So what insects can really provide is is a new source of variability that are easy to cultivate because the other thing okay so you got your corn but then we got our cows that eat corn so now you don't have corn so now you don't have cows yeah you know so the whole thing will crumble if something happens to corn um but having insects that can eat a a wide range of vegetable products whatever it is um that that's going to be easy to cultivate in place of corn um, it just adds variability, which adds more security to our food through global climate change. That actually kind of like leads into um, my next question. So we actually, ecologically, we usually compare eating crickets or mealworms as like mini livestock and compare it to like beef and cattle because it's like, well, cows take up this much land, but you could have insects that take up like this much land. Mm-hmm. But as you were saying, like we compare them to beef and like chicken and stuff, but we use them like wheat. So how do you like bridge that discrepancy? Oh yeah. So it's like you wouldn't like like I know in some cultures like you could go and ask for like a bellows to matted appetizer. Right. But like I don't really 
see that as an yeah. immediate future here. You won't like uh-huh. ask for like, can I have a grub on a plate, please? Right. And I think that's that asks a really interesting question from an anthropology point of view, and it's how we perceive food. Um, and so right now you say like, you know, how we're promoting insects are protein bars and things yeah. like that that are, are that's not a dinner. You yeah. know, so it's not never going to replace our steak. Um, and so the challenge is, though, is how can we do that? Like, how can we I- incorporate insects into a food that makes up the main portion of our diet? It, how can we make it not an appetizer? Um, and so there's, there's, you know, you can make a burger out of mealworm, ground up mealworms. I mean, just, and I think it works the same way as any meat alternative. It just still yeah. happens to be animal based, so it has a that same nutritional profile. So think of all the black bean burgers or tempeh yeah. burgers or soybean burgers or, you know. Um, and so I think we have to kind of think about how we can get soybeans to not be on the appetizer <laughs> and become the, the main dish. And so it's going to be the same thing with crickets. Is how do you get it to not be viewed as an appetizer and have it become the main dish? Um, and there is actually, to give them a shout out, <laughs> if you look them up, there's, so the Thought for Food Challenge is is I don't know enough about it. You look up their website, but it's a competition to give money to somebody who's thinking about food sustainability. And so you got all these different groups, usually student-based groups. Maybe they all have to be student-based groups coming up with answers to the challenge of food sustainability. And and then they go into the top ten, and the top ten then give a big pitch. And this year it's this month. It's in February in Lisbon, Portugal, and then the winner gets however many thousands of dollars to start up their company. Oh, and cool. one of the top 10 is somebody, their product is called Sifu, C-F-U. <laughs> so, um, so C-F-U, but they're playing off of tofu. But yeah. what it is, is it's a cricket-based protein that's, that's more like meat. So mm. it's bug meat. And, and it's served in, in, as a replacement for a meat instead of these kind of supplements. Um, and so they're doing, so they've made the top 10, who knows how far they'll go, um, but they've got the attention of these thought for food people who are thinking about these food sustainabilities. So they are in that kind of transition of how to make it not just this side dish yeah. and make it the main portion. I, I actually have made like cricket brownies. Okay. So yeah. like um, one of Marianne's students uses crickets to make flour yeah and he just like gave us the mix so nice. I, I actually made the cricket brownies they're, nice. they're pretty good actually did you cut it with a different flour did, did, did you no like, i just did, it, it nice. was it was already it was like in a bag and mm-hmm. it was like a brownie mix so it was oh, like yeah, add okay. one egg and gotcha. like yeah so a little bit of water um so talking about the future a little bit more what do you think are three changes that have to happen for insects to be widely accepted in western culture there's a study that came out and i you know it's just something i read online but I think it was spot on because I really related to it. And it was this idea of who will eat insects. Like, yeah. who in the West will be the first ones to accept insects? And my joke, I always told people, I was like, you got to get to the hippies. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to get it at Whole Foods has always been what I've said over the years. But somebody came and, and they did a survey and, they, and they, they broke that down to being a little bit more scientific than get the hippies. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they had said, you have to have two of three things. And one is be an adventurous eater. Are you somebody who's going to try different foods, try different cultures, foods? Th- those people might be more interested in eating insects. The other one is, do you not eat a lot of meat already? So if you are someone who eats meat every day, if you're someone who eats meat three times a day, you're probably not likely to give up that meat for insects. Um, so somebody who already does meatless Mondays or something like that, or already likes a tofu bur- like tofu occasionally. Or is a um, starving graduate student. Or a starving graduate student <laughs> can't pay the prices for, you know, for good beef or whatever. Um, but then three is somebody who bases their food choices on environmental reasons. Um, and so this is actually a lot of vegetarians. A lot of vegetarians are environmental vegetarians, not necessarily like animals have souls vegetarians mm-hmm. but um but that because beef takes so much land so much water they don't eat they don't eat meat so crickets being so much 
more sustainable in the amount of land and water they use to produce the same amount of protein um, is, a, is a very appealing choice to those people. So having two of those three, and so I find it funny because I'm a horribly picky eater. I am too. I, I, I didn't I, eat a vegetable until I was like 20. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I am clearly, though, the I don't eat a lot of meat and I make my choices for environmental reasons. And so it's like, yep, got me. You know, but, and when I first started this, I didn't want to eat bugs. Like I had to eat, my advisor made me eat a termite because (laughs) I was studying eating termites and I didn't want to. And then I did. Marianne keeps harassing me. She'd be like, you have to eat it. So I like finally caved like the cricket brownies. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I won't be able to see them. But the flower actually wasn't ground quite perfectly. perfectly. (laughs) So you could definitely see like a head in a way. I was like, I'm just going to do it. And I was like, it was fine. Like. Um, so probably like hiding it too yes. helps. There's kind of different. There's almost like <laughs> stages of introduction. Like you yeah. start with the brownie, but then you can eat like sushi that might have a whole cricket in there, but you don't really see it. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you'll then go ahead and see the crickets just kind of tossed in a salad. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you'll start just eating a handful of crickets, you know? So it's kind of these stages of introduction for different people. It's kind of interesting that you mentioned sushi because like it used to be like... It was kind of like this a weird exotic thing that they did, and then now people are really excited about it here. Um, but I feel like people already kind of have a stigma against insects. And I thought of an example. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but like lobsters used to be not eaten by wealthy people. Right. It was like the slave or, food. Yeah. But it somehow like transgressed that yeah. cultural like segregation, I suppose. Yeah. And now it's like you pay a lot of money for a lobster. So right. how do you, like, how did that happen? And yeah. do you think insects could follow that same trajectory? Absolutely. I would th- I, you know, that's good to know. I, that's a very good example. I know that to be true, what you say. <laughs> I do not know how they did it. I don't know what the catalyst was. Um, it's just something I just don't know. But sushi is a really good example because, you know, it was in California. You have a lot of Japanese immigrants, and they wanted to have restaurants but raw fish was just not anything that people were interested in in the United States. And so some genius was like, well, what if you put the rice on the outside? Because sushi traditionally oh. is rice with the raw meat, the raw fish on top. But the roll, the sushi roll is an American construct. Huh. And it hides the raw fish on the inside. But even before that, they made the California roll, mm. which uses avocado to give you the fatty kind of texture instead of the raw tuna or raw salmon. And so the California roll was the introduction, was the gateway to sushi for Americans. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it could vary. It's basically what you're talking about. Exactly. Stage of hide it first and then kind of like slowly introduce it. And then once enough people are like, oh, this is really awesome. Hopefully like just then you, you get less, then you start trying eel or whatever because you like it. So you say that you're picky and your advisor made you eat a termite once. Is there any bug that you like to eat and how do you like it prepared? So I find it funny because, well, and I think everybody kind of eats insects, has their preferences. Um, but I always find it funny because crickets are the ones that are, are the most exciting, like are, are, make, are forging the path, kind of like the California roll in, in a way, or putting, you know, sashimi tuna or something. But... Um, I prefer mealworms over crickets. I think so. Crickets have kind of a. Um, if you've had any southeast, we're just southeast Asian cuisine. Dried shrimp is a mm-hmm. is an ingredient in it a lot, and the smell of cricket flour is very much like the smell of the dried shrimp ah. in these foods. Um, so it's pretty. It's kind of mm-hmm. seafoody. It's got a. It's got Makes a pretty sense. strong scent to it. Um, yeah, I mean, exoskeletons. And <laughs> yeah, things, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, but mealworms are just a lot nuttier to me. Hmm. Um, so just a to- toasted mealworm, slightly seasoned, hand- by the handful, is my favorite. Cool. So great with beer. That is the perfect. <laughs> like instead of bar peanuts, it should be bar toasted mealworms. Marianne says bar toasted crickets. Yeah. So you guys yep. can. <laughs> and I think she agrees. She likes crickets more yeah. than mealworms. So we we disagree on our taste preferences. I think that was actually everything I wanted to ask because you kind of like you kind covered of them. <laughs> covered them, yeah, along the way. So all right, yeah, good, that was awesome, awesome. Thank you. Well, I hope that I feel like we, like I said, six million years of evolution is You'd like it's tough to cover in a short time. I'd like to thank Dr. Lesnick for doing this really fun interview and coming to UGA and talking to us about her research.